Good evening. Can I get your attention for a second? I'm Kira Blackwell from NASA headquarters. And I'm Bernadette Maple with the Space Foundation. And we would like to welcome you to the first Ignite the Night at the 34 Space Symposium. Bernie, are you as excited about being here as I am? Yes, I can't wait to hear about all the amazing technologies our innovators are going to share with us this evening. To tell the truth, I am so excited that I'm here because this is the first time the new gens have ever allowed me into one of their events and I didn't have to use a fake ID. <laughs> if you're a new gen out there, can you give me a shout so that I can hear, you, hear that you're here? That was kind of weak for our future leaders of this amazing space <laughs> industry. One more time. Yeah. Woo! Thank you. Well, not to burst your bubble, Kira, but this is also a NASA iTech event. Maybe we should tell them what we have in store this evening. The Ignite the Night event is a mini version of our NASA iTech event forums. And NASA iTech is a program that we have within the Space Technology Mission Directorate Office that searches for cutting edge technologies that are solving problems on Earth that also have the potential to be a solution for NASA and the space industry. Is this like a spin-in technology program for NASA? Sort of in a way it is, because technology is moving at such an exponential pace we really need to identify ways in which we can leverage those cutting edge technologies that are already being invested in, sort of like an iPad where we can buy off the shelf rather than reinventing it. This allows the agency to be able to strategically invest in technologies that are unique to the space environment and that don't have a commercial market path. It's great NASA has programs like this. As a taxpayer, that excites me. But none of this would honestly be possible if I didn't work for an amazing agency like NASA. We have some really great leaders that encourage and support us to try new things and that have been known to, on occasion, tell us things like, run until apprehended. Because if you slow down, someone will stop you. And if uh, someone's in here, they know they've said it. <laughs> Well, speaking of running, since we're on a tight schedule tonight, can anyone tell me what an elevator pitch is? Anybody? Anyone? No one knows what an elevator pitch Go ahead, shout it out. <laughs> Two minutes of hell. <laughs> Two okay. minutes of hell, I'll take it. <laughs> that's there we right. go. If you can summarize the technology in two minutes, that's pretty darn good. Um, but in a few minutes, we're going to hear from 11 presenters that are going to give you their best space elevator pitch. And each presenter only has two minutes to tell you about their technology and how they believe it can solve a problem for our space industry. And in true NASA iTech fashion, where we lean on both our NASA experts as well as external experts to vet the technologies, we have a panel of volunteer judges that will score each presentation, and they'll depart for about 15 minutes to tally the score and let us know who the winners are. No pressure, guys. But we're going to start on this side. If you could just raise your hand when I say your name. Dennis Andrusik, he's with NASA headquarters. Susie Cunningham, NASA Kennedy Space Center. Christopher Deal, United Launch Alliance. Rich Godwin, Space Technology Holding. And... Gun Glocken, I hope I said it right. If I didn't, sorry. Um, with the United States Air Force, Peter Hughes, NASA Goddard Space, Space Flight Center, Janet Karika with Jacobs, Michael Lembeck, KRB Wiley, Rob Meyerson, Blue Origin, and Zach Myers, Ball Aerospace. Wow, you got some fans. <laughs> Kelly O'Neill, Camone Ventures, Harry Partridge, NASA Ames Research Center, Jim Reuter, NASA Headquarters, Karen Rucker, Brooke Owens Fellowship Program. She has fans too. You must be the new gen people, <laughs> just thinking. And Frank, I'm going to chop your last name. So can you say it for me? Sal's Gaber. Sal's Gaber. Thank you. Christian Shahidi. Haiti. <laughs> and Jennifer Shu with Northrop Grumman. Wow. Anyway, thank you for volunteering to participate in this event. Honestly, I couldn't do it without your support either. 
um, because you someone's got to do the judging. <laughs> And as a nonprofit organization, the Space Foundation couldn't accomplish what we do without our generous supporters. So I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors this evening to help make this event happen tonight. Boeing, BWX Technologies, Cosmic Advanced Engineering Solutions, Lockheed Martin, and Space Camp. Thank you for making tonight possible. And NASA couldn't do it alone either. I mean, because you couldn't be eating food if it was being paid for by your tax dollars. I'm just saying. So I'd like to thank the Space Foundation for actually teaming up with us to host this event this evening. Your organization has actually been a faithful advocate of our, our agency and our space industry for decades. Thank you. We appreciate all that you do, and we have high expectations that you guys will continue to do amazing things in our space industry. All right, it's time to get started as we introduce each one. Let's welcome to the stage Analytics Space Incorporated. Again, that was kind of weak, guys. Hello, thank you for having me today. Um, so every day, more data is generated by remote sensing satellites in low Earth orbit than the amount of data in the Library of Congress. However, there's a major bottleneck in getting that data from the satellite back down to the surface of the Earth. My name is Dan Nevius. I'm one of the co-founders of Analytical Space. We're a startup based out of Boston that's about two years old. Uh, started by myself and my co-founder, Justin, while at Harvard Business School. Both of us have space backgrounds, um, but we met after being introduced by a former colleague at the OMB, and we pulled together the initial team from NASA across some MIT labs and the Harvard ecosystem. We are building a network of data relay satellites that can help remote sensing satellites get more data to the ground and reduce latency uh, from collection to analysis. Today, remote sensing satellites can only offload data when they have line of sight to a ground terminal on the surface. So they place these ground terminals all over the planet to get the best coverage. However, 70% of the planet is covered in water, which results in only a couple of hours per day for these satellites to offload data. And increasingly, sensors are becoming more spatial, spectral, and temporal resolution, leading to higher data rates. And there's an increasing demand for decreasing the amount of time between data collection and analysis. So our satellites are six U CubeSats that will be able to receive data via radio. Uh, so we can be backward compatible with the hardware on these remote sensing satellites flying today. We store that data on board and then downlink it uh, with optical comm. So we're hoping to increase the amount of total throughput and eventually decrease the latency. As we have a single satellite, initially it's a store and forward service, but as we build more, we get greater coverage, network them together, and decrease latency uh, for these customers. Our first satellite is launching in May 20th off of the International Space Station and we'll be demoing that capability to receive data from a customer and shoot it down with optical comm. So we have uh, some limited opportunities to do beta testing, so if anybody's interested, I'd love to talk to you after the event. Uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, and let's welcome to the stage Astroscale. It's my cheat sheet. Okay. How many of you have uh, opened up your app um, to get a direction to Space Symposium? I guess everyone, right? Uh, could you imagine the world without it? Uh, no more Google Maps or Ubers. I don't even myself uh, how to get to, okay, back to the board more. Uh, my name is Chie Noguchi, PR and communication at Asoscale. We are a global environmental company to tackle space debris and aiming to be commercialized by 2020. Our headquarters is in Singapore, and our R&D office, uh, where we are currently building um, BBM in Japan, grant segment in UK, and we're just announcing a US representative in DC. There are three things I want you to remember. First, the space is vital. Second, it gets crowded and dangerous. The third, now it's the right time. Um, Vital because it's essential, essential to our daily lives. And second, there are about seven to 8,000 of space clocks launched and 1,400 of them are still active. That means that restores space debris. And the third, now is the right time. Within 15 years, um, the number goes triple and the chances of collision just gonna get higher. So we need to, uh, uh, we need to take action now Astroscale offers two things. Uh, one, EOL, end of life service, 
That means uh, no, uh, don't add more debris. The second, ADR, active debris removal. That means uh, take out existing debris. For EOL, uh, we will attach a paramagnetic plate to the target satellite, and uh, the chaser satellite will uh, find it, capture it, and bring it down. And do we want to protect our beautiful planet, the Earth? We are here to tackle the space reach. Thank you very much. Um, I forgot to mention that there's this little sound that goes off <laughs> if you start to run over your time. So it's kind of like a mini shark tank, so, you know, hence the dun -dun. Um Let's welcome Deep Space Solutions. What would you do if you were 200 million miles away from Earth and you've just landed on the Martian surface but you've lost 20% of your bone density? probably gonna look outside your window, take pictures and send them on Instagram back home because that's all you're gonna be able to do. You can't walk, you can't do anything. My name is Munir Alafranji. I am uh, a mechanical and aerospace engineer for Deep Space Solutions based out of Washington, DC. We're a startup at the very, very early stage. We just launched in January. But we have a zealous R&D team. We have a zealous medical and business team working together. The first prototype that we're looking at is called the Vitruvian Resistive System, the VRS. And its main focus is to grab intelligent data. It's an exercise machine that grabs intelligent data from astronauts in a microgravity environment. The kind of machine that we've built can pull data that currently is not existent. Force with respect to time and range, so position with respect to time, as well as all the bells and whistles, frequency, duration, and so on and so forth. The cool thing about the VRS is that it's limb independent. So if you injured your right knee, you can still use it. And it isolates every limb independently so we can study it further. It's simple, easy to, to use, and essentially has no risk to the, the user. Currently, we have 45 million Americans over the age of 50 that, are, that have osteoporosis. And they say weight-bearing exercises is the only answer that they have because me medicine is, is failing. I don't see my grandma doing squats with, with free weights. So something else needs to happen here. If we can test this on things like the International Space Station, obviously we have some machines there that the astronauts are using, including the, uh, the ARID. These, are, these help, but they're not the answer for any deep space explore, exploration. Once we remove the vector of gravity, these little tiny forces start making noise. We can start studying them better, and we can help people here. We know that the future of machines is intelligence. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you. And now we will welcome our friends from Deririum Labs. Hey, good afternoon, thank you very much. Um, well, actually, I forgot what I was going to say. Well, um, there is a great opportunity to take advantage of the resources available in other planets and even asteroids. Uh, however, uh, th that was the beginning of the technology. However, last year there was this very big earthquake in Mexico where many people died, and actually uh, I thought I was dying there too. So that was the time when I understood when people say that space technology was also meant to help people here on Earth, right? So, well, thank you very much. My name is Carlos Mariscal. I'm the CEO of Dream Labs. Um, Dream Labs is a 17-member company based in Mexico City. Um, I love those guys. Really love them. Um, well, what we do is basically rovers for exploration, rovers for autonomous exploration. Those rovers uh, actually started as a student team for NASA competitions. We were to like three NASA competitions. Uh, we did like a pretty good stuff. And, but now we decided to take this as a company. So the rovers communicate actually now with other, robot, other robots such as drones. Uh, they use collaborative control, they use artificial intelligence, and why do we combine those two kinds of robots? We do it to explore wider areas uh, in a less amount of time, uh, to have better samples, uh, I don't know, many, many things, right? So that's, that means less money invested, uh, wider area explored, and therefore, like, um, the profit 
is maximized. So now imagine this applied to space. Imagine this applied to people lives here in Mexico. The, uh, sorry, see, here in the world, in the earth, I'm sorry. Uh, well, that, uh, that actually means that space technology can be applied to people's lives and to uh, space sector, actually. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Well, welcome to the SAGE, Intercept Nexus. Warner Von Braun, Arthur C. Clarke, and the late Stephen Hawking all have given us a vision of a spacefaring human race. And now we are on the cusp of that age. I'm Carlos Noberger, founder and CEO of Intercept Nexus and inventor of High Altitude Air Launch. High Altitude Air Launch, intended as a super heavy lift launch vehicle, is designed to compete directly with Falcon Heavy reusable on cost per kilogram to orbit and on total mass to orbit. However, it will be in a class of its own on payload volume size. Designed for a captive carry underneath Paul Allen's straddle launch, the booster will be mounted transverse as opposed to forward facing. The fared wing will generate its own lift, reducing stress on the vehicle. It will jettison above 60,000 feet, and it will jettison sideways and continue on into LEO. It offers the flexibility of air launch, and it offers the weight of a ground launch vehicle. Commercial off-the-shelf oxygen tank will sit in the leading edge. Commercial off-the-shelf hydrogen tanks in the trailing edge. And the payload sits in the quarter court of the wing, up to 100 feet. Applicable operators could be commsats, 300 kilogram satellites from Ball, or potentially in the future, a vision could be deep space habitats. With a launch vehicle, it will finally be made it feasible for us to build artificial gravity space stations. We could re reduce the impact of microgravity on the human body, and we might actually be able to make space our permanent habitat. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And next on stage, we will welcome Minerick. Within the next decade, the world is at risk for a digital meltdown, as demand for mobile networks is expected to increase at least 10,000 times. Are we ready? Hello, I'm Joe Farnbach. Good evening. I'm CEO of Mineric USA, and uh, Mineric USA is part of the greater Mineric Corporation, in which we have consisting of about 80 employees in, uh, from about 15 countries. Our headquarters is located near Munich, Germany, and our U.S. operation is located in the Rocket City, Huntsville, Alabama. Our team, our founders, I should say, started working together a number of years ago with the German Space Agency, and they started a company about 10 years ago. Our team designs and manufactures laser communications equipment, specifically uh, ground stations and some airborne terminals, we also, which they provide secure high-speed air-to-ground and air-to-air -air links. We also supply some components for space, and our first space terminal, I'm proud to say, will be completed early next year, and you're looking at a full-scale mock-up right next to me. And so what is laser communications? For us, laser communications is fiber optics, but without the fiber, okay? Traditional technology for communications relies on uh, RF or radio waves, uh, they tend to be slower, they're easier to intercept, they're more susceptible to interference, and they operated in regulated and increasingly crowded parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Our technology, on the other hand, relies on advanced free space optics to transmit information as a, as a light ray, which is ultra fast, as you know, has low latency, is highly secure, cost effective, hard to detect, difficult to intercept, now you know why I'm reading this, susceptible to jamming, not susceptible to jamming, I should say, resistant to electromagnetic interference, power efficient, et cetera. Thank you very much. Yeah, we're kind of a tough boss up here. 
we have a short schedule. So um, let's welcome to the stage One Milo Incorporated. Hi. So we've just learned what 340 days living, working, securely cocooned in zero gravity does to an astronaut's health, and it's alarming. The space program needs any time and anywhere lab diagnostics, and so do we. I'm Russell Lee, and I founded One Milo with Dr. Lawrence Lee, and together with our engineering, biochemist, pharmacy, and business development team, we're enabling lab grade tests for self-screening to be available anywhere from now. We're based in Miami, Florida, and we have an FDA-approved manufacturing facility in our lab in Pompano Beach, of all places. Um, our team has over 300 FDA trials under its wing, and we have over 100 years of medical professional experience. So my, one Milo is disrupting medical diagnostics by enabling lab tests to be performed anytime and anywhere for the first time. We've, we've developed a suite of micro devices, which I'm supposed to be holding in my hand right now, but American Airlines has my baggage. <laughs> Each device is an FDA approved rapid result lab grade test using microfluid samples of blood, urine, and saliva. Each device is embedded with a smart, patented smart uh, ecosystem which, which wirelessly streams the result from the device to the One Milo app for archiving and trending. Ordinarily performed 13 billion times in labs each year, the device is intended to create economic and clinical efficiencies to patient health. Whether on any frontier in space or in the third world, this, where there's ex extreme pressures of science and nature on our body, it's a perfect translational technology from space to Earth. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. And next, welcome to the stage. Open Cosmos. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, hello, I'm uh, the founder and CEO of Open Cosmos. At Open Cosmos, we provide simple and affordable space missions. 60 years ago, a computer would fill a whole room like this, cost millions, and be only available to a few researchers in the world. Today, we carry them in our pockets. What we want to do at Open Cosmos is to remove the three major space access barriers, technology, paperwork, and cost. We do that by providing our customers a development kit that enables them to integrate their technology in a compatible way with ours. What this allows is to deliver a service to an end user in uh, an order of magnitude less of cost and time. And I'm not here to say what we will be doing. I'm here to say what we have already done. Because we already delivered our first mission to orbit last year, and we delivered it in less than six months and with a budget under one million. And this includes building the satellite microchip up, launch, procurement, uh, insurance, frequency location, everything as a service. We believe that this will empower a number of companies, hopefully among the audience, to use this technology as a tool, to solve big problems, and to do many applications out of them. 60 years ago, the digital revolution took place thanks to computers. Today, I believe that satellites are the technology for the next technological revolution. And, uh, but it's time to put these satellites into the hands of the people. It's, it's time to, to open the cosmos. So thank you. You guys get to see me twice in a row. We're going to welcome Scientific Florida Incorporated. I became a pilot. I wanted to fly. That was my dream. The Apollo explosion, the challenge strategy. That's Rick Husband and his crew aboard the Columbia Space Shuttle, which broke apart, killing the entire crew upon re entry, all because of broken foam. The problem is none of them knew they had a problem until it was too late. 17 deaths because of the inability to communicate potential issues. 
So we set out to find some sort of solution that will allow for in the moment diagnostic, diagnostic hygiene across all systems. A kind of movie recommendation from Amazon Video, which uses artificial intelligence, and then it hit me. Why not use the power of predictive analytics to make our space safer? And that is how Spacevisor was born. Spacevisor is a self-learning AI-powered system health management system that S system. You got this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. System that provides predictive analytics that go beyond just tests and breakages. With this capability, we, we spacecraft can now communicate with all missions platforms in real time, and most importantly, predict future outcomes autonomously. With this means, we can now communicate. Um, with this ability, we can triage these incidents before they play out to a tragic conclusion. Don't we all want to have a safer future to protect anyone in the aerospace industry or aviation industry? Great, great job, thank you. And next up on stage, Sintony. Power consumption and orbit determination are key limiting factor of nanosatellite technology. Good evening, I am Christian Beck, Vice President of Sentony, located in Toulouse, South of France, a three years old startup. Power availability is limited in CubeSat by design and GNSS receiver typically used for positioning required more than 30 seconds. To output first estimates without a priori knowledge. Orbit determination strongly impact the battery life of the satellite. Sentony proposed a solution to both problems through the use of its technology used in IoT. In IoT, if you have a GPS chip for geolocalization, the lifetime of the battery is one or two months. With Sentony technology, it's more than 10 years. Being up for 10 milliseconds instead of many minutes needed by a standard GNSS receiver to get the first fix in space, Sentony technology reduced the GPS energy budget by 99.9%. .9%. If you want more information about us, tomorrow come see me at International Center at 3.30 p.m. I'll be speaking more time about my company. Thanks. Okay, last but not least, because we also did these alphabetically, is the U.S. Air Force Academy Laser Optics and Research Center. Is there anybody else that works with this guy? No one? I'll cheer for you. As of 1 April 2018, there are 3,758 confirmed Earth-sized exoplanets and many more candidates, which is really exciting, except they're light years away. The reality is that Earth 2.0 might be right under our noses. We just haven't been able to detect it yet. Good evening, everybody. I'm Cadet First Class Prayant Tantra from the United States Air Force Academy's Laser and Optics Research Center in Colorado. We have designed a small, compact, lightweight apparatus for high contrast imaging of dim exoplanets next to bright stars. It can be used as a, small, as a deployable space telescope or as an attachment to ground-based optical surveillance systems. We've done this through the use of apodized photon sieves. Apodized photon sieves are diffractive optics that essentially change the way we traditionally focus light. As opposed to allowing light, to, light intensity to gradually drop off, these optics drive the light intensity to drop off rapidly, creating a dark region around the image in which we can see dim exoplanets. We can easily manufacture these with polymers. We can put them in small space satellites and then deploy them once they're in space, once they're in orbit. This gives us the advantage of low volume, mass, and cost. 
this 20 centimeter prototype on this three cube satellite right here weighs less than three grams. Traditional optical systems are limited in their ability to resolve close objects. Our system can see dim objects next to bright ones as close as two lambda over D, which is an improvement on traditional systems by a factor of 10. Additionally, another issue is that when imaging objects that differ greatly in brightness, the, di the brighter object will often oversaturate the sensor, rendering the dim object completely undetectable. Our system has been designed and tested in the LORC laboratories to provide sufficient throughput at 10 to the minus 10 levels of contrast. Appetite photon sieves are the future of exoplanet imaging. Our home away from home may be much closer than we had ever conceived. Thank you. So right now, I'd like to actually ask the, all of the entrepreneurs to come up one more time for a round of applause. But for, before you, if you guys can go ahead and come on stage, but before you give them an applause, I want to say it's really tough to stand up here on stage in front of an audience like this and give a pitch for just two minutes. And so when you give them applause, I hope that they hear it across the Broadmoor because these guys have done a great job and I'd love to hear them hear how much we appreciate hearing about these technologies. All right. Now the judges are going to have the opportunity to ask questions of all the presenters that will help them with their final scoring. Please keep in mind we only have 10 minutes total. So Dennis Andrusik, we're going to start with you. And if you remember, if you have a question that will help you with your final score, go ahead and ask that. If you don't, pass it to the next. OK, uh, I'll start out with uh, an Analytic Space Incorporated. Can you? Can you guys pass the mic to each other? I'll talk while you get the mic. Thanks. With regard to your constellation for the communication capability, have you looked at how many spacecraft you would need in order to make it a commercially, vi or a, a commercially viable uh, architecture? Yeah, so there are a couple of different approaches we could take. We tried to design the company so it could be useful with a single satellite. Mm -hmm. So even if we're in a different orbital plane than the customer, we've kind of done all the statistics of how often we'd have line of sight. So even then, we could provide additional throughput, kind of beyond what you can get just with the ground terminals. It's kind of on top of the ground terminal network. Um, but eventually, we plan on building kind of a hula hoop of satellites in a single orbital plane so we can start uh, cross-linking between them to get low latency. And to do a single orbital plane in LEO, it's on the order of 15 to 20 satellites to start to get that low latency capability. Um, but we can provide a commercial service just for additional throughput, even with a single satellite. I'm going to pass right now. Yeah, really nice job, folks. Appreciate it. I'm going to pass as well. Thank you. You guys did a great job. I have one question for the gentleman from the Air Force Academy. Um, this is an incredible technology that really inspires me. Have Thanks, you sir. thought about where this would go in terms of a commercial application? Uh, sir, we're still in the early stages, but we really think that this, the applications of this are essentially limitless. We could, uh, right now, what I sold to you guys was exoplanets, right? We could see exoplanets. But there's a huge interest in asteroid mining and other uh, aspects within our own solar system that we would like to see and explore. And this gives us the ability to see things that we couldn't see before. So your question is kind of difficult to answer in that this might allow us to see things and discover problems and ideas that we never thought existed before. All right, great job, everybody. My question is for uh, Boldly Beyond. I was wondering what non-aerospace applications your technology might be good for. Well, we can do predictive analytics, so we can predict something that be possible to happen in the future. Uh, for example, um, um, for an uh, aircraft fleet, for example, and uh, um, the oxygen cabinet is going down, we can predict perhaps already when it breaks down in three days, four months, how more data we collect, how more information we can give you back to you. Again, great set of presentations by all of you, really inspiring. Um, deep Space Solution, how do you measure the effectiveness of, of your uh, exercise uh, methodology? Yeah, very good question. We actually built a prototype 
and uh, brought some uh, personal trainers to come and test it out. And so now we're looking at the second prototype. Um, and so we look at data, and what we're seeing is that just because you're, le you're left-handed, for example, and this is a stronger arm, does not mean this will last as long as, as, as much as your right arm. We're seeing all these different things that we take for granted. Um, so we definitely need to validate our hypothesis by getting a lot of hours and a lot of data in before we move forward. We're still at the very early stage, but we're seeing things that we don't understand. And so the Vitruvian resistive system isn't trying to replace anything, at least not yet. It's trying to identify or find the solution, which is currently hiding between data. No other firm has a solution, but we know how to find it. Thank you. Hi, great job, everyone. This question, oh, all right. Charlie, okay, you guys take that back. Uh, great job, everyone. This question is for Open Cosmos. Have, how have you worked the launch piece? Uh, it's a very good question, as, as you know, are probably all aware that uh, the launch is one of the bottlenecks. The way we target it is, is we build very strong relationships with the launchers from the early beginning. And most importantly, we are a way for them to get access to a number of satellites that otherwise it would be very hard for them to process and to go through all the process. We do all of that for them. At the end, we just deliver them a deployer packed with satellites that they can put in orbit. And I'll just pile on, great job, everybody. Uh, for one Milo question, uh, what is your price per sample compared to if I have to go and walk into a lab and have the same test done? Um, it's really cheap. We're talking about um, a retail price um, in Walgreens for a three panel cholesterol test in about two months time for $30 for one test. And each additional test is $5. So you can test your family for $80, 10 people for $80. Great job, everyone. I'm going to pass on questions. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for, uh, great job, first off. You all did a really fantastic job. I have a question for the Air Force guy. Is the, <laughs> sorry. That's me. Um, is there adaptive contrast control, uh, or is it just, it has to be on a star, or can you change it and look at uh, other things that are dark, but there's other darkness, you know, l lower levels of darkness. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yeah. Absolutely. We can, so we can see pretty much anything uh, as long as there's a difference in brightness, up to 10 orders of magnitude. So whether that's planets, asteroids, whatever it might be, uh, we can see it. Um, it doesn't really matter if one is, say, uh, five orders of magnitude less than what we normally image. Because as long as there's a difference between that and what we're looking at, we can see it. Thanks, everybody. I uh, wanted to just acknowledge that you all did a great job. I am going to pass on question. Well, thank you all. You all did a nice job. Uh, for the Air Force, again, uh, what's your stability requirement in order to get the 10 to the minus 10? So the stability requirement, I don't have the number off the top of my head, sir. Um, but one of the great things about this system is that it's rotationally invariant. Meaning, typical systems that are similar to this right now require you to stare at something uh, pretty stably for a long time. And you only see, you don't see a full circle of darkness, you just see a small region. This will allow us to see a full circle. Uh, if you want to hear more about the, uh, the actual numbers on the stability, uh, I'd be happy to answer that afterwards. Okay. And for one Milos, um, you didn't, how does the, the cartridge work and will it work in space? So yeah, we've, um, we've done some work on that, and yes, it would work in space. Um, each cartridge is designed to, to absorb the fluid and, and suck it in, and, and so there's a, a, a specific area where we can meter it using reflective photometry. Um, sorry, the, the first question? Would it work in space? Would it work in space? And yeah. how, I mean, so it's, it's a capillary type approach? Yeah, so um, there's, th there's three types of tests, which are enzymatic, antigen, antibody, and chemistry. And uh, depending on what, what we're looking at between blood, urine, and saliva. Um, and then there's different metering systems for each of those. So it's traditional finger stick technology. We've created a micro device for each one. Each one is a certain panel. So we can have a three panel cholesterol. We can have a 12 panel <laughs> urine. We're working on a, a BMP for, for NASA, which is an eight panel uh, basic metabo metabolic panel. We have a DPD urine test, which is um, a, a bone density marker. Um, pretty much everything, each one, each device is a specific test. 
So it's using microfluid. There's a limited amount we can do with microfluids. We can do about three or four different uh, uh, diagnostics. Great job, everyone. It's really hard to get on an open stage and talk, and I really appreciate how great you did. I have a question for uh, Darian Labs, uh, Carlos. Um, and uh, my question is, can you tell me of a uh, terrestrial application for your swarms or constellation of robots? Yeah. Um, well, the first application we found was for um, rescue and look for trapped people during uh, disasters derived from uh, natural phenomena such as earthquakes. And other commercial applications we found are for agriculture, for precise agriculture, and um, for, uh, for mining. For we have, we have found that in several markets such as this, there's like a really, a real necessity of implementing rovers or robots where um, people cannot get into or could be a, like a very hostile environment. Thank you. I don't have a question. I just wanted to say you all did a great job. You're very brave, and I don't envy any of you. <laughs> My question is already answered, so awesome show, awesome job, and um, don't give up, success takes time, and, uh, and continue um, and fo fo follow your dreams. These were wonderful presentations, this was such exciting stuff. Um, I have a question for Astroscale. Um, who <laughs> Who are you um, talking to? Who is going to be our, our consumers? Uh, in the short term, our uh, potential customers will be um, constellation operators, but we are currently in discussion with because um, space debris, in order to remove space debris, we talk to we have to talk to government agency and space agency or um, all the operators as well as yeah, basically space industry as well as um, many stakeholders. <laughs> I don't know if this answers your questions. Do I get to go? <laughs> of course. Thank you. Uh, great job, everybody. Um, I have a question for the free space optics groups. Um, there's two of you, right? Um, so traditionally, I think the, the limitation for free space optics is atmospheric turbulence and cloud cover. Um, specifically, space to ground communication. <coughs> do you guys have a technology that specifically addresses that? Uh, we do. I'm probably not the right person to ask that question for, but yes, that's something we've worked with very closely. We're working with um, some business partners on that, and we're, all, we're evaluating some new innovative t techniques, I should say, to go do that, potentially licensing that. So it's part of our commercial offering. Yeah, so we have a couple of ways we're trying to approach it. One is just um, figuring out the best sites to put the ground terminals in the first place, just ones that have statistically better weather. Um, and then sites that aren't correlated and they have bad weather on the same day. Um, so that's just one approach to trying to increase the amount of time that you can have that kind of clear pass. And then the second is once we're at scale and we can start sending information between our satellites, then we can dynamically task around the cloud coverage. So hopefully that helps us solve that challenge. If there's no more questions, one more round of applause for all these guys. You did a great job. You guys, go ahead and give Jen. So Bernie is going to take the judges right now off to the off to a room. Bernie, where are you? Okay, so she's waving. She's kind of short, so you guys have to really. Uh, no offense, I'm just saying like I can't see your hand over that guy in the blue shirt, right? So, and they might not. So anyway, if you guys could head off with her, she's going to take you off to a room to tally the scores and make their final selections. But while they do that, I thought it might be kind of cool if you could get a a glimpse at the winners from what, a real, from what our NASA iTech forums are really like. So we have three top presenters that will be on a panel tomorrow at 11 o'clock. And tonight, they've either brought prototypes, and they're gonna tell you a little bit about their technology. I kind of only limited them to two minutes. These are amazing technologies. I mean, if you haven't seen a Roomba for the ISS, you're about to see one. And how this could actually help us, He's about to tell you, he's got two minutes, so give him an applause for Germ Falcon. Thank you, Kira. So this is really where uh, infection control and aerospace kind of cross over. We really got into this space. We uh, built a, a machine that uses ultraviolet sea lights like they use in hospitals to disinfect airplane interiors. 
We built a, a flight attendant's food and drink cart. It goes up and down the aisle. It's lined with ultraviolet C lights like these in hospitals, and it disinfects all the surfaces on an airplane. This got NASA interested, and we uh, took, a, took a step back, and our R&D team took a look at some of NASA's uh, infection control needs. So on the International Space Station right now, uh, the crew is required to disinfect the surfaces with wipes once a week. This is not part of their mission. Uh, what we're, what we're uh, proposing here today, what we're showcasing, is this little device which uses UVC LEDs and easily navigates the, the International Space Station with little propellers in microgravity. Uh, I'll admit that we do not have the navigational software capabilities in-house, nor do we have the zero-gravity testing that we're going to be required to do. Um, so that's where you guys come in, and we're looking for your help on that. Basically, this is where your Roomba and your drone have a kid, and <laughs> the kid can disinfect the space station. <laughs> so I would love to speak to whoever wants to talk uh, as soon as we're done. All right, thank you. And the next company is FGC Plasma. But before he comes up, this guy, this is his, I'm sorry, I have to tell the story because it's amazing. This is his high school project. He won a college scholarship to Case Western, before you say ah, and then started a company. So he's 24 years old. He's done some pretty amazing things, and he's probably pretty intelligent. The technology is pretty awesome. So Felipe, come on up. To clarify, even though I look pretty young, I'm no longer in high school. Uh, <laughs> but I'm Felipe Gomez Ocampo, the founder and the CEO of FGC Plasma Solutions, and I'm here to tell you that the next big thing in aerospace is actually small. And I can do that thanks to these redesigned fuel injectors, which use plasma to change how we burn fuel across a wide variety of systems. So what's plasma? It's the fourth state of matter, right? So you think solid, liquid, gas, and then plasma. It's essentially a soup of charged particles flying around that's really useful at, for breaking molecules. So we use that to break apart fuel and air molecules and improve how they burn. So the first application for this is really more to do with the A in NASA, right? The first A in NASA, aeronautics. Think about the last time you flew out of or got stuck on a really busy airport. You know, you might have been idling on the ground for, you know, 30 minutes, 20 minutes, or, you know, an hour. Your engines are running, just burning fuel. What our technology could allow airlines to do is to keep these engines running, but with less fuel. So that could add up to fuel savings of between 1% and 5%, depending on the length of flight. Uh, we're also working on applications for this for gas turbine engines and for a couple other military engines as well. Uh, we're based out of Chicago, Illinois, uh, in, at Argonne National Laboratory, funded by the Department of Energy. And for more information on our technology, you're going to have to come and see the iTech panel tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. So the last one that you guys are going to see is Somatic Labs. And I'm just going to say, when I read the proposal initially, I thought to myself, this is going to be the bridge between what we see and integrating what we feel. And it's a pretty cool technology. So come on up. Hey, how's it going? Um, I'm Ajay Karpur, and I'm the CTO of Somatic Labs. We've created a platform for communicating information through your sense of touch. So our technology is able to create a sensation that feels like someone is moving their finger across your skin. And we use that to communicate information in situations where people's eyes and ears are unavailable. For example, if I wanted to let you know that there's something to your right you need to pay attention to, you would feel a, sens a sensation moving to the right across your skin. I have a prototype with me here today, and Kelly's going to help me demonstrate. So she's wearing uh, a headband form factor on her head. And I have a control panel here on my phone. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to press a button, and then she's going to feel a corresponding tactile sensation and react accordingly. So her eyes are closed. And I'm going to let you know what I'm going to press. So. So I pressed the button, and she uh, felt the sensation moving to the left across her forehead, and she responded accordingly. And we're able to do more than just directions. Our technology has uh, the ability to turn your skin into a programmable display. So by reprogramming your sense of touch, we can use your skin as a new communications channel. This solves a real challenge with cognitive overload and situational awareness. Uh, individuals who are working in high-stress environments who have their hearing and vision overloaded or obscured 
need a new modality to get information. Um, for example, a pilot in a cockpit could feel a sensation on their head corresponding to the location of the sensor on their aircraft that they need to pay attention to. Or an astronaut conducting extravehicular activity uh, can monitor the status of their consumables in their suit while they're keeping their vision on their work and their hearing on their radio. We, uh, we've designed our technology to be easy to integrate in existing products and systems, and we've already integrated with mixed reality headsets, clothing, and helmets. If you see opportunity for us to integrate with your avionics, uh, I'd love to give you a demonstration. And if you want to learn more, come to the NASA iTech panel tomorrow. Thank you. OK, so that's the end of all the presentations other than when we announce the winners. So I'm about to head off to make sure the judges can make some, some decisions and narrow it down to two. I've been down this road a few times, and that's pretty difficult for our chief technologist. So um, enjoy your drinks and mingling with one another. We'll be back in maybe 10 minutes at the most. And uh, thank you guys for coming out, and I hope that you enjoyed the show and seeing all the technologies. So everyone did an amazing job, and NASA iTech has a forum where we open it up for presenters to do this very thing. And so for those of you that presented tonight, my hope is that you guys will apply for a NASA iTech forum. The companies that have participated have raised quite a bit of money in the hundreds of millions and of private investment dollars. And so although we don't give away award money, we provide a platform for people to hear about your technology that are interested in investing in it. And so if I can get all of the companies to just come back up here on stage and line up, all of them. Then we're going to announce the winners. And one of our judges is my boss's boss, Jim Reuter. He's the acting AA for space technology. And Jim, if you can come up here and join us too, because he's going to hand out the awards. Can we give them all one more round of applause? And then, Jim, I'll hand it off to you. OK, well, thank you, Kira. Um, did you have fun? Did you enjoy it? Yeah, I, I thought this was a really exciting event. One of the things we try to do in space technology is, is recognize that right now is such a changing time in our industry, um, and really one of the most exciting times in my career that I can think of. And so what we're trying to do is, is find some innovative ways to reach people that we wouldn't reach otherwise. Um, and I think this has been shown to be a really effective way to do that. Um, and you know, I'll say this sitting as a judge, man was two minutes short. I can't imagine what you went through. And, and, and so for us, it was really, uh, <laughs> or was it too much time? <laughs> I, I can't imagine having to, d done that. And so I really commend every single person, everybody up here was, was really, was a success just from participating and, and having more guts than I might have had at, at my stage, at that stage. And so I really appreciate that. So it was a tough time for us to, to really decide on, on, on how to narrow this down. So, but what we have is um, an early stage, what we consider an early stage winner, a, a late stage winner, and then we wanted to add one honorable mention. And so we'll start with that. Uh, the first honorable mention for really a, a very uh, creative uh, approach, uh, scientific, very scientific, was, and we'll give that to the U.S. Air Force Academy. Uh, early stage. It's all on you. Ah, analytical space. Yay! Congratulations. Great job. And then late stage, one Milo. Congratulations. Okay, great. Oh, and I have something. 
<laughs> so um, I really want to thank all the judges for participating in this. I wanted to thank everybody for, for uh, that participated in, from the audience, and especially I want to thank Kira and her team for an outstanding job once again. And thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Bye. Great job. Thank you so much. Great job.